Well, welcome everyone. We're going to get going and uh, have a discussion about dehydrating and dehydrators. I'm Teresa Hunsaker, formerly with USU Extension. Um, Thank you. And I'm happy to be part of Smith and Edwards food preservation program efforts. So I want you to be thinking about your questions that you have as far as dehydrating and dehydrators go and hopefully uh, at the end we'll have time or as we go along we'll have time to answer some of those questions. So dehydrating has been around for a really long time. Not necessarily commercial dehydrators, uh, residential dehydrators, but at least the act of pulling moisture out of food to control for microbial growth. So if a microorganism or a pathogen doesn't have moisture to grow and reproduce, then that food then can be stored. But the responsibility is on me to be able to pull that moisture out of the food sufficiently to allow it to be packaged up and then to be stored for long-term storage. So yes, we have dehydrators today that help us do that, but I'm gonna talk about a couple of other things along those lines. Um, one other point that I wanted to mention in this regard is the fact that you also still have what we call degradation. So even though I've pulled moisture out of it, there are still growth enzymes that are in the food that can still deteriorate it, can change the color, the texture, that type of thing. So moisture isn't just an always about microorganism um, and its growth and control, but it's also about the control of the enzymes. So even though I may pull the moisture out and help control even the degradation of the enzymes, I still will have color change over time. So that beautiful dehydrated zucchini slice, for example, may not stay that beautiful color a year from now or two years from now in storage once I have it stored. I just want to make that clear. This isn't a forever thing, even though I may have that food in hand and in storage, it may not look so great, may not taste so great as time goes on. But my goodness, that's the same with any other food, right? Think about that. It could be bottled fruit 10 years from now, doesn't look as good as it did the day I put it in the bottles. So it's no different in the case of dehydrating, all right? Okay, so as we look at <coughs> a little bit about dehydrating foods, I get a lot of questions, or did, at the extension service, and I actually still do, um, about what foods dry well. Well, most of the food that we have can be dehydrated. Now, maybe not lasagna, but individual foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, herbs, all of those kinds of things, I can dehydrate, right? I can also even dehydrate cooked rice, cooked pinto beans in my dehydrator or in my oven if I don't have a commercial dehydrator or a, a, a home dehydrator. I could even do it in my oven if I control for a few things. Um, and so, I can have instant rice, or I can make quickly a soup that has dehydrated pinto beans, but the pinto beans have been pre-cooked and then dehydrated. Just like the rice, I'm going to pre-cook and dehydrate, okay? So think broadly when you think about a dehydrator. Um, there's a lot of advantages to having a dehydrator for a lot of different foods. It isn't just about those apple slices and a few pear slices and makes a fun snack, although that's great, right? There's other opportunities. Um, apparently, there's even a dehydrator now for making your pet treats. <laughs> I used to make dog bones and things, you know, dog treats for my dog. Uh, years ago when we had a dog. So there's lots of things that I can do by pulling the moisture out, controlling for the enzymes, and then storing that food if I've done it correctly. All right, so now I have to decide what kind of method am I going to use for pulling that moisture out, and what are some things that I want to know? What are some things that I want to 
control for, right? Well, one of the very first ones is the air circulation. The very best thing that I can have in dehydrating is air movement that will help pull the moisture molecules away from the food. So that air circulation, and you think about it, what happens in a dry, windy, arid environment, right? Everything just dries up. My skin dries up, my plants dry up, right? So that air movement is very, very important. Then the other thing that I have to have is some degree of temperature control or at least a high enough temperature that's going to help those water molecules to start that evaporation process, then with the air to pull it off of the food, okay? So those two things. All right, so what are the temperatures? What temperatures do I need to have? It's gotta be warm enough, right? To do a little bit of converting and, and transitioning of the, the water molecules. So I want it to be for outdoor, and we'll get to this in just a second, I want it to be at least 80 to 85 degrees. For a commercial home dryer, I want it to be able to have around 90 degrees and higher, all right, not just 90 degrees. Okay, so we've got some temperature and some air circulation um, concerns that we need to account for. Now, let's talk about the air circulation and the temperature in terms of my options for indoor control or indoor dehydrating and the controls that I have in place for those and the outdoor. So with outdoor, I can do sun drying. Now I want you to think about this for just a second. What is the difference between sun drying and solar drying? And Anna, I know you know the answer. <laughs> Her lips are sealed. So what, when you think about those two terms, do they seem similar? Pretty much, right? But they aren't the same. So sun drying as if I just had some kind of a screen and maybe some cinder blocks or something that I lay my food out on and I expose it to the rays of the sun and to air movement, right? Solar is actually like a solar oven that we were talking about where I'm capturing and reflecting. And so I have more intense heat, in fact, as much as 20, to 30 degrees difference. Now, I know today we're talking about commercial dehydrators for indoor dehydrating primarily, but I wanted to mention this. I grew up in Arizona. Arizona is my home. And in Tucson and in Phoenix on those 110 degree days with low, low humidity in the air, we did a ton of not just solar and not just sun drying um, outdoor, but we were also able to grow other things as far as what's considered vine drying. So soybeans, peanuts, things like that, where I could let them literally dry on the vine, right? It could be some of my legumes. It could be um, some of my dry beans. So those three forms of outdoor drying are still used today by many people, especially if you have a low humidity day or week or environment and a high temp day or week or month, like in Arizona. Okay. So those are still options. What's some downside to those though? Insects maybe? Yeah, exactly. Insect infestation. So I need to have, and you'll be able to find online, these almost hanging circular shelf netted objects for layering the food in for outdoor drying. So don't discount that because Utah and this part of Utah certainly have a number of days that you can get quite a bit dried in a short amount of time, okay? So it's still an option. So don't discount the fact that outdoor drying is in place, but I do want to have some kind of a cover. I want to have some kind of a screen, a mesh, a net, something that's going to protect. Now I can dehydrate in my big solar oven. I have a huge all-American 
um, solar oven that we love and it works great for dehydrating. Um, I have to watch it really carefully. I can't have I can't have it lined up with the sun. It's just too in intensive heat. It'll get 350 de degrees in no time at all on a warm summer day. Uh, when I was teaching a class in Southern Utah for the uh, Being an Outdoor Woman Conference, we hit 325 uh, just outside of St. George up by Vail um, in no time at all. Yes, questions? Sorry, yeah, so you said that you can dry them on the vines here like these? Yes, yep. Okay. You so, keep them on as long okay. as you possibly can through the dry heat season. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you know when they're done? Am I jumping ahead? No, you're, no, you're not. Um, they, the, the vine literally will dry up. The leaves okay. will dry up. The husks around some of them or the shell coverings around some of those pods yeah. will literally dry and you will know. They, they will be uh, almost crisp okay. and you leave them on as long as you can, okay. whether it's your soybean or, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I accidentally did it then. <laughs> <laughs> you dried your ass. Yes, <laughs> Um, another thing with sun drying is people when they're harvesting, because we have pecan trees in Arizona as well, and we would um, crack open the shell when we, we talk about not just vine drying, but even drying like nuts and seeds, my pumpkin seeds and things like that. I can use the sun for that as well. Okay, so options. All right, indoor, um, definitely room temperature. I can make bundles of herbs. But that's about the only thing for indoor. A lot of times they'll mold out or get rotted if I have things, in, you know, too big of a food density. A slice of zucchini or apple or that kind of thing, it will rot before it will dry. So herbs are about the only thing for just regular room drying, like hanging my herbs. Um, you can use convection ovens. Now convection ovens have the feature of an airflow, right? They've got the fan in them. Um, <clears throat> somebody has asked me about an air fryer, if I can dry in an air fryer. And the answer is yes, effectually you could, but you can't control for a low enough temperature typically, and so you don't get a great quality. Um, but anyway, convection ovens, you still can control uh, the temperatures low enough. <clears throat> and then conventional ovens and then microwaves for herbs only. And I can do a number of, of um, paper towel sheet plates of my parsley, my sage that I grow out in my garden in the microwave if I'm really careful and I, I can get through quite a bit. Um, or I can just leave those more tender herbs on paper towels just on my counter. Uh, I have a kitchen downstairs and just leave them um, out to dry those, the parsley, the cilantro, the more tender herbs that way too. So that's another option rather than using the microwave and having the potential of burning them because I haven't quite got the hang of using the microwave. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit about each of um, these in a little bit more detail. When we talk about sun drying, we're looking at a need to have not only the protection of that food from insect control, but I also am going to have to, on any outdoor drying that I do, I'm going to have to do what we call pasteurize that food so that once I bring it in from outside, I need to heat it because I don't know if little teeny bugs might have laid some larva in and gotten through the mesh or the screener. It's amazing to me how a mosquito can get in the house when I have screens on my windows, screens on my right. So maybe bugs and infestation come in. So we want to talk about the fact that I am going to need to pasteurize when I have done anything outside. So following these steps then, making sure that I have some air circulation in whatever I'm using for sun drying, even for solar drying. When I use my All American solar oven, I need to keep the doors open on it so that the airflow is in there. Otherwise, the humidity will build right up inside 
my solar oven? Well, I then got to put a screen over my solar oven in order to protect for the in insect infestation. And it is amazing how fast things can get infested. Um, so make sure that you have those screens. Another thing is that we want to make sure that people realize that this is primarily, and I know that there are countries and cultures and places that cure or dehydrate meats and vegetables using the sun or the solar option. But we find for optimum safety and for best quality to avoid solar or sun for vegetables and for meats and or jerky. Again, I know that there are places. I have been to other countries and I know that they will take fish and fillet it and dip it in salt water and put it out on the, the mesh trays and that type of thing. But that's not something that we recommend when we have other options for better control and better safety, okay? So with that pasteurization then, I can do this. Now this is for outdoor dried foods, primarily fruits, again, or fruit leathers. My mom used to line up cookie sheets in the dashboard of the car, <laughs> roll down the windows, and still there was no screen, right? Anyway, so the, <laughs> there's two options. It was frightening. Um, and we survived. I'm here to tell about it. Um, but the thought makes me crazy. But pasteurization, again, for all outdoor methods of drying, I can either do it in their freezer and hold it in the freezer for just a few hours or I can do it in the oven, place the food on a single layer in a tray in the oven. And it's just for 160 degrees for 30 minutes. So just basically on warm in my oven. Okay, so those are the two options for killing anything that might be hidden <laughs> in my outdoor dried food. All right. Now, room drying, as we've already talked about, I have used ristras. Are you familiar with the ristras that they string the peppers, they cut a slit in the, the peppers and they hang them and they actually become ornamental as far as from your back porch or you know, whatever. I, that is one that I have done, I grew up doing. Um, I, we learned how to do that in Tucson and we would hang them from posts off of our back porch. But that's the only vegetable that I have done is my peppers, my pasilla, my whatever, my long chili peppers, you know, whatever. Um, I have done that way. <clears throat> I do still want them to be out of the sun, but I want them to be in a really warm environment. And so those are options that way. And again, I've done, I grow a lot of herbs around as as ornamentals in my yard um, and I have bundles and bundles of sage right now and bundles and bundles of rosemary right now because I'm putting my yard to rest for the winter and so I've been harvesting and um, those work great for all of my herbs is the outdoor option on either in the garage or or in my shed or somewhere but I don't have a lot of light um, or actually indoors if it's pretty cool in my house right now though with the weather the way it's been uh, and so I like the temperatures to be a little warmer and so the shed works really well. When I do those outdoor, um, not indoors, on my bundles, I will put a brown paper bag around them, um, not only to help with absorption of the moisture and that type of thing, but to protect it from all the dust and that kind of thing. That's just me. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. That's why you're here. For the peppers and the, the string uh -huh. types, I have so many peppers right now. Um, I, I'm sure I can just YouTube it, and then you just put like a paper bag. Right. Over Up that. over it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I can hang it in my shed outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Now here's what I do, and this is something that our cute little neighbor in Tucson taught us. And that was we cut a slit almost down the whole side. And once it's dried, you won't see it. It won't, it's not, you know, unsightly. 
but it will help with that airflow and the moisture inside getting out, especially on some of those heavier skin, like the poblano pepper, um, or even some of my jalapenos. Those are just, those are a tougher skin, right? So I, I do cut that slit almost down the whole side or, you know, one part of my pepper, whatever pepper I'm doing. So, and they, they work great. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. So room drying, an option. Now let's talk about oven drying for indoors and using the oven. Again, we're going to get to dehydrators here in just a second. The one thing about an oven is the temperature control and it can get too warm. So even on warm in my oven, I'm at around 180 to 200 degrees. So I have to do something to enhance the airflow by, and I set a little fan on a stool. I crack the door open on my oven. And so there's some air circulation that way. And then I will cycle my oven on and then I'll come back, I'll set the time for a half an hour and I'll come back and turn it off and then I'll leave it for a half an hour and then I'll come back and turn it back on. Do you see what I'm saying? So I'm paying attention. I also set a thermometer, in, just a hanging thermometer for the oven inside so that I can see on some things, this might be too warm, but for fruit leather, it's great. It's very, very easy to do fruit leather and enjoy uh, a nice quick big batch of fruit leather in do, the oven. Do you have a convection oven? I do. Okay. Yeah, I have both actually. I've got a kitchen upstairs and a kitchen down. The one upstairs has the convection. The one downstairs is just a conventional. So that's where I put the fan. Right. Okay. So again, I want to have good air circulation. I don't want the oven to be too stacked with too many racks of food. Uh, I don't want, I want there to be better air circulation maybe than what I would even do on a tray in my um, commercial dehydrator so that my pieces aren't up touching each other and squished onto my cookie sheets or that kind of thing if I am doing whole pieces of like zucchini or that type of thing. Does that make sense? I want there to be space in between rather than having these trays too full. All right. There are some disadvantages, obviously babysitting it, um, having to, you know, go turn it off, turn it on, check the temp, turn it off, turn it on, put the fan there, blah, 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 right? But um, again, it's an option if I don't have a commercial dehydrator. But then the cost of energy right now, right? The power for either my gas or my electricity. So there's a downside, but it can be done and I have done many a batch of fruit leather. I don't know why, I just, I like my fruit leather in, in the oven. And so I do a lot of fruit leather um, in the oven instead of on my dehydrator trays, even though I, I've got the uh, tray for covering the um, dehydrator tray that will keep the food or the, the puree on the tray and not dripping all the way down through the dehydrator. Okay, so now let's talk about these dehydrators. And I'm so pleased that we have so many to look at today and to consider. So just know as far as price, as far as selection, as far as options, this, it, it, the sky's the limit. Um, Smith & Edwards has a number of ones to choose from and a number of good ones to choose from. So how do you select? What are you looking for? Um, they are nice to have, and I do like having the um, temp control where I can see kind of where it's running. I don't have to put necessarily a thermometer on the tray and do temp checks, um, but I still do that just to see that the dehydrator is running about where it tells me that it's running. So again, that's just an option. Also, when I look at the design of them, there's some that heat from the top down, there's some that heat from the bottom up, there's some that heat from the side, the horizontal. So we wanna take a look at all of those options as well. And then what else do I look for? Well, we've already talked about temperature being critical and air circulation. So I do want to make sure that there's going to be a good air flow or a fan that's going to give me some help in that air circulation and then a way to have it vented, right? So a couple of things. The very first thing, and I talk about this in my Master Food Preserver classes, and it isn't until we see the difference that my students typically will say, now I get it. What is a double-walled dehydrator? 
what, what does that mean, right? So let's take a look at the difference between this, and it's the same brand, between this tray and this tray. And I said to the, the folks here, now I'm going to be talking about advantages and disadvantages in dehydrators. What can you see? There's a little venting around the Exactly, edges. venting around the edges because there are two walls. Can you see that? So this is going to provide me better air circulation than this one. Because once those trays are full, and nothing wrong with this, but once these trays are full, all I have is the air coming down through. Now, where is it going? Is it what's happening to the food on the very top, the food being pushed through the fan and heat system on top down through? What's going to what am I probably going to have to do with these trays? Rotate. 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 Right? And not that that's a bad thing, because almost any food preservation requires some tender, loving care. Whether it's dehydrating and the type of dehydrator I have, or whether it's pressure canning, or I need to know what I'm doing, right? In order to get the best um, outcome. So, again, nothing wrong with this. The difference in price was a hundred and, remind me, ladies, one night, two hundred basically, to fifty dollars. All right, so we've mentioned one thing already, and now you can see why it would be an advantage or a disadvantage to go one way or the other. Do I probably still want to or need to, on some foods, rotate the shelves, even in this one? The answer is yes, but maybe not as frequently, and maybe not, um, you know, for some foods, depending on what I have there, I may not need to at all for some foods, like mushrooms or my green onions, or you know, whatever, okay? So that's one of the very first things that we're gonna talk about. So when, it, when I say double wall construction, that's what I'm referring to. And double wall construction can look different on different brands. So this is the Presto, and this one is $120, okay? Now this isn't how it stacks, it rotates um, these go in, out, in, the way the shelves, you'll turn them this way, can you see? So they'll rotate differently, but then it condenses down to be less space for storage. So I want to make sure that I understand not just how uh, the, the dehydrator is designed, but how it stores as well, because this takes up a lot more space than this condensing down the way that it's stored. Okay, enclosed heating element. Almost all of them now don't have an exposed heating element. That isn't the case on older ones. So when you're at a garage sale, don't be surprised if you see an older dehydrator that has an exposed heating element. That's a safety thing just for burns and touching and you know that kind of thing. So all of these now have, your, your fingers can't get to the heating element. Right? They have a protective cover screen or plate over them, okay? But you'll want to look for that if you're looking at older ones because I've definitely seen them at yard, yard sales that have the exposed heating element. I do want them to be a countertop design just so for ease and mobility and that kind of thing. Um, just makes it easier. The reason that I say that is because there are big, enormous dehydrators that are floor standing and they have 25 shelves in them and they're they're lovely they're much more expensive but for what most you and i would be doing it's nice to just have the countertop easy to put away in store again the enclosed thermostat or something that will help guide me to know about where i'm at as far as the temperature and so when you look at these different models you'll see some of them just have an on off switch I, they don't have an option of a dial that even says high, medium, and low, or 90 to 140, or 145, or some of them that are used for um, jerky, where they can get up to as high as 165, right? So again, what are you going to use it for primarily? Not that I couldn't do jerky in these, 
I would just have to do a couple of other things and we'll talk about that. Okay, does this make sense, you guys? So these are the kinds of things that you're going to look for. Okay, this is Teresa Hunsaker's personal preference, this next one, and I've put that on there. I like a higher wattage. I like, and Vicki Vicky used the term earlier, get her done, right? Just get her done. With a higher wattage, I typically will have better air circulation and it is faster because maybe the temp controls as well as the air circulation of the power of the fan itself. And it can allow for more trays than something with 500 watts or 450 watts. Again, nothing wrong with these if I'm just doing small amounts and I don't need a ton of stacking additional add-in trays or that kind of thing. Now this one comes with this mini. This, we took this straight out of the box this morning. But can you see the difference? So personally, this is just me. I look for a dehydrator that has a little more power that allows me to get a little bit more food done in a little less time. So that's going to be the advantage of a higher wattage. Not that there's anything wrong with a lower watt dehydrator, okay? All right, you have to decide for yourself. I'm just giving you the what to look for. Uh, we've already talked about the fan or the blower. Um, how many trays, yes, I can buy add-on trays, but how many can it feasibly get done in, in a certain amount of time? Like, I don't wanna be doing this for years, right? I, I want to get through my peaches or my apples, especially my apples, um, right? So again, I think about what does it come with, what would be the add-on, and what's the recommendation? Because this one may say six to eight trays. Well, there's already four here. So really, feasibly, I can only get a few more trays and maybe it won't be as effective. Again, nothing wrong with that. I just need to pay attention to that when I'm making my purchase. Uh, I do want the underwriter's uh, seal on there for the electrical having been checked. Um, a year guarantee, perhaps. Um, is, it, is it something that I can get serviced if something goes wrong? And I can tell you most of them you can't. <laughs> there aren't appliance centers that will do dehydrators. The Mending Shed in Provo is about the only place that I know of that would do that. Um, and then dial for regulating the temperature and then the timer. Uh, is it programmable or is there an option? And do I care? I don't care. I'm gonna be there, right? Yeah. When you mentioned harvesting your apples, what time, this is my first year having my apple tree. Um, when do you usually harvest those? That when you see a, a, a fair amount start to drop on their own, you will know, and then you can tell by looking typically at them, mm -hmm. um, and then just an easy pick off of the tree. Okay. But this is the time of year. Okay. Yeah, we're harvesting apples, most varieties, right now through the first frost. Okay. Cool. Yes. Is or there, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I was asking, is there an advantage from the fan on the top or on the bottom, or is that? No. What I want to look at is the design for airflow and where is the air going. Is this just pushing straight into the counter with no way to vent? Is it forcing it back up through the bottom? You know, what are my options? No, it isn't. It. it there isn't necessarily, I do find though in the ones that, and this, uh, this one isn't the side, I don't believe, is this one the side? I have one that is a side, it's a rectangular side and it's a limb, but is this one a side? He, I didn't look at it closely, I should have. I, don't, I think it's on the base. Um, but anyway, the one from the side actually has a little bit better air flow when it comes horizontal than when it comes either top or bottom. Typically, these are a little more difficult to find in 750 watts, though, or higher, 700 or higher. Okay. I find too when you're doing apples, if you use the apple peeler, slicer, quarter, so they're all the exact same thickness. And exactly it's in prepping the food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And slice it and away you go. I love those for that consistency in the size of the slice for dehydrating. I. I have two of them. I, I can't get through apple season without my apple core or peeler or slicer. Yeah. Okay. The cost. This one actually is only $49.99, so $50. So I put $75 to $450, depending on 
I, there's none here that are that much at Smith and Edwards. Um, this is, I think, your most expensive one, isn't it? I got a lamb down there that's similar to that yeah, one. Yeah, the bigger one. a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Um, but love them. Um, and again, how much food am I going to be dehydrating? All right. So the major disadvantages of dehydrating, no matter which one you choose, is the limited capacity in terms of if I've got three bushels of apples and it takes two days to do one batch in, well, almost two days by the time I actually prep, slice, get them on the trays, and then they're done, I'm into this almost a two-day time frame. Okay, that's not going to give me a ton of apples, right? So that's the one drawback to large quantity dehydrating. And that's why some people do go to the, stand, the floor standing models and pay the extra um, in terms of quantity. But again, to me, that's not a huge disadvantage. They aren't a huge power draw on your power bill. You won't see a marked difference, really. Um, now, if it's constantly going for the entire month of October as you're doing pears, peaches, and apples, and you know maybe a few other things, then perhaps, and I have two of them going at a time, I may see a little bit of increase in my power bill. But again, for the most part, they're pretty reasonably priced and pretty reasonably um, just as far as storage and design and use, that kind of thing. They're just, they're just a nice thing to have on hand. Uh, again, we've talked about the horizontal flow and the vertical flow, whether it's bottom up or whether it's top down on vertical, doesn't matter. Um, just again, the major disadvantage is the different foods dry, the flavors can mix, the liquids can drip into the heating element. Um, um, if it's a, a base heating element. So again, some things that could be a disadvantage for. And so I typically try and dehydrate similar foods together, like I'm doing apples, right? So this, my whole trays are filled with apples or apples, pears, and peaches or something like that, where I wouldn't have onions in with my, my peaches. <laughs> well, some people might, but I wouldn't, okay? Now, a major advantage on this vertical is that it does re reduce the flavor mixing. Um, and so we, we see less of that flavor change. But again, I'm already going to be dehydrating similar things together. I just am. Um, in fact, I will be doing vegetables in one and fruit in another if, if I have vegetables that still need to be done. So that's just me. Uh, temps for drying, we've already talked about kind of that 90 to 140 temperature range. I do still want low humidity, so uh, you know we're pretty lucky here in Utah that we don't have high humidity days. Uh, maybe a few during monsoon season, but for the most part, we're pretty lucky. Um, in drying, then, I want to spend just the last few minutes of class discussing the preparation of my fruit and or my vegetables. So let's start with vegetables. Um, we have found that for Controlling that enzyme, that aging enzyme, or that growth enzyme that we were talking about, blanching is really a smart move for most vegetables as a pre-treatment before they go onto the trays. If you have ever just taken a carrot and sliced it because you think, oh, this is so easy and slick, and put it on a dehydrator tray, it'll dehydrate fine. It'll take a long time, um, but it'll dehydrate. It's when I go to reuse that carrot to rehydrate it and put it in a soup, that I'll say, what in the world did I do wrong? This isn't rehydrating, and it's not. It is still crunchy and horrible and chewy. And so blanching my vegetables, whether it's my corn, whether it's my carrots, whether it's my green beans, whether what, whatever. Now, I don't need to blanch onions, garlic, any form of onion, garlic, even my peppers, I do not, there's no point. I throw them into my salsas, my stews, my soups, my, and they rehydrate just fine. Um, I don't need to blanch my spinach if I were going to dry spinach or, you know, because I don't blanch my basil, right? My herbs. So some of those leafy kinds of um, foods that I might dehydrate for some things, uh, I, I don't blanch either. Okay, so. Then on the blancher, if it takes more than, so I have this pot of boiling water, then I have my big drop colander that goes in that has my vegetables in it. 
Once that comes back to a boil, I check my, the water underneath will uh, change the temperature when I drop those veggies into it. When it comes back to a boil, if it takes more than a minute to return to a boil, I've got that blanching colander too full. So that's the one disadvantage is that I can't get through a lot unless I've got a couple of blanching colanders to work with or steam colander, or anything that will help me do this, okay? So that's the one thing with blanching. And then I plunge it into some ice cold water or ice water and then I let it drain and then I'm ready to put it onto my dehydrator trays. But I do let mine drain really well. And again, you kind of get the system going of how to set this up and it works great. Okay. Now, quantities of water need to be smaller. I can salt if I want to, or I can leave it out if I need to. I dip that briefly after it's boiled for the amount of time that is required on the different dehydrating charts, and you can get those in various books. Will you hold up your book? I, this is, I was so glad that she brought this. This is an awesome book on dehydrating, and you can get it online. There's another one called How to Dry Foods that is equally as good. Those are my two favorites. And then there's one called The Dehydrating Bible. Um, those, that one and How to Dry Foods, this one here that she has, the Dehydrator book. And the How to Dry Foods are my two favorites. And then the third one is The Dehydrating Bible. So those are, those are top three in books to refer to. And you can get those really inexpensively online. And they will give you, as well as the extension service, will give you charts on how long to blanch. So do I blanch peas 10 minutes? No, it's like one to two minutes for small peas, or it's three minutes for green beans, or do you see what I'm saying? So we're not talking a real long time once it comes back to a boil. Cool it down, drain it, and then put it on my dehydrator trays and I'm ready to go. Now with vegetables, how do I determine the dryness? What we call a crisp is what, where we're at. Most of us aren't gonna do what I had to do in my dehydrating class at my food science classes in college. We literally had to do the math on percent solids and moisture reduction. So we had to weigh the trays, tear out the trays, put the fruit or the vegetable on, and then we would dry it based on the mathematical equation of percent solids. Yeah, who's gonna do that, right? Yeah, nobody, I knew that. So we just say, and I don't either anymore. I did because I had to. Every now and then I will just pretend I like to do it. But it's about a 10%, and when those carrots are crisp, when that corn is crisp, when those onions are brittle, you're with me, right? Crisp, that's... Now, vegetables are pretty easy. Fruit isn't as easy to know where I'm at as far as my percent moisture. Um, and I don't need to condition and we'll talk about conditioning fruit in just a second. I don't need to condition vegetables. That means equalizing the moisture content like I do in fruit, okay? All right, so vegetables, crisp. Okay, so now let's talk about fruit. Fruit has so many advantages. There's also some disadvantages, and a lot of people, the biggest disadvantage in dehydrating fruit is going to be the nutrient loss for vitamin C, the heat volatile vitamins, right? Um, but as far as overall ease, fruit is lovely to dehydrate. And we had so much fun with all different kinds of fruit, not just in our master food preserver classes, but we, my husband and family at home, we love to dehydrate fruit. The thing with fruit is it needs a pretreatment too for most of it, not berries, but for most fruit, especially fruit like peaches, pears, bananas, uh, well, and even on the vegetable side, potatoes, mushrooms, that type of thing, um, they draw, or they, they brown, right? So I want to prevent browning of my fruit, my peaches, my apricots, my apples, my pears, by doing a pretreatment of either ascorbic acid, lemon juice, pineapple juice, that kind of thing. So that is the one thing as far as getting my fruit ready is taking the time to do that pretreatment. On whole, fruit like grapes or cranberries, um, you have to do what's called check. And you plunge them in boiling water, then you plunge them in ice water and it pops the skin so it opens them up or else I need to go through and prick them with 
a toothpick. Or if I'm pitting my cherries, I can use my cherry pitter and that's gonna break open, right? But if I don't check my grapes or my cranberries, they'll rot inside because the moisture can't get out. The skins are too dense, right? So that's what that is. I've given you here on the screen a couple of options for pre-treating. I want to mention one that isn't as popular but is the most effective. Um, your book will talk about it and all of the how to dry books out there will talk about sulfuring or sulfiding dips. Most people don't do sulfuring anymore, but it is the most effective pretreatment. So when you go down here to Smith and Edwards and you're looking on that fun treat aisle that they have with all of the sweet treats and things, you'll see dehydrated apricots. Well, I don't know if you guys still have them, but you have in the past. And they're this bright, pliable, flexible, beautiful apricot, right? And you're thinking, that's not how mine look when I finished dehydrating them. What happened? They're using a sulfite or a sulfuring method to preserve. And it is the most effective. I have done it. Um, I have done it for a long time. You can either buy flowers of sulfur or online or even some pharmacies will carry what is called the sulfite dip. It is a food grade, notice I said emphasized food grade, um, sodium meta bisulfite. It's a salt, it's a crystal, okay? You'll dilute that in water and truly it is the most effective for keeping that nice bright color and a more flexible texture to your fruit. But the hassle is accessing the sodium bisulfite, okay? Um, but it is available and it's not expensive um, and it's no different than just diluting it in water and then soaking your fruit slices in it, okay? Or halves, like my apricot halves. There's also ascorbic acid. I have put these in order of most effective to least effective. So sulfuring sulfite, ascorbic acid, ascorbic acid mixtures like fruit fresh or ever fresh that are sold here at Smith and Edwards downstairs. Then there's a fruit juice dip, a honey dip, a syrup blanching and a steam blanching, okay? So again, there's many options for preparing my fruit for long-term storage to maintain the color, the texture and nicer, right? Again, it's just what step do you want to go to? Once I have pre-treated, I don't soak my bananas forever. It, it, it's just a few minutes and that's, I'm done, right? And then I get it onto my dehydrator trays. Um, I don't want the temps to be on fruit. I don't want the temperatures to be more than about 135. So again, um, I will get this sugar crystallization that will cause um, this kind of a sugar syrup, almost like a candy coating on my fruit if I'm not careful at high temperatures. So usually 90 to 130, 135, the very most. So I'm not gonna go as high as I might for drying vegetables to 140, okay? Again now, determining dry dryness. When is this apricot done? When is this apple slice done? The thinner, obviously, that I can keep my fruit, that's why Vicki's mentioning that apple peeler core slicer is so slick but I want to a 20% moisture content. You're not gonna do the math, most people aren't. So I don't want it to be sticky or tacky. So I might take two or three pieces of my apricots or my apples and I'll put them in my hand and I'll squeeze them tight. And then I'll open up my hand and if they fall back apart, they aren't stuck together in a gross bundle, right? Then they're probably done, okay? I want them to still be pliable not necessarily crisp. I, I could go to crisp if I wanted to really be sure. Um, that will make my apple like, you know, tough to eat like jerky or whatever, but it's still an option. And yes, I'm going to be safe. Um, I just don't want it to stick to itself. And I want to make sure that that moisture content is um, dehydrated out sufficiently. So I've done that much, right? I've gotten that far. Now I want to cool it down, and this is the after drying. When I think it's done, I've done this test, I'm saying mm, maybe we're ready, right? So now I let it cool down to room temperature, 
but I'm not going to officially pack it and, and put it in storage at this point. I'm going to make sure that I put it in some kind of a, a bottle or a jar or a plastic bag or something like that. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do something with it. This is called conditioning. Okay, this is before I package it up. I brought it to room temperature and now I've got it in some kind of container where I can see whether or not there's any condensation building on the side of the jar, in the bottom of the bag, or on the sides of the bag. It's getting kind of a cloudy moisture look to it. Um, something where I can visibly see. This is allowing for not only the moisture on those thicker pieces or more dense pieces of fruit, to equalize, but it's also allowing me to see if I got it dry enough. Because if I just put that fruit right off the dehydrator trays into a bag and my seal a meal or, you know, or my vacuum sealer, whatever, I keep using that brand, I, I shouldn't, um, to my vacuum sealer, whatever, and on the shelf, I could easily have molding. And so many people get frustrated with dehydrating, especially fruit, because this is what happens. They're like, I'm not ever gonna do this again. I just lost a whole bushel of apples to mold growth. And I, why, what happened? I don't know what I did, right? And they get frustrated. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this conditioning step is really vital, that you take a look and make sure that there isn't any moisture buildup. And that after a day, a two, you're gonna see this within a couple of days, for sure. It doesn't even need to go as long as a week. It really doesn't. You're gonna see this immediately. Put them back on the dehydrator trays you're going to know and then it's also equalizing the moisture throughout the, the food as well okay so any questions about conditioning this is a step that most people do this is not the same as pasteurizing if i had been outside drying okay this is conditioning that moisture level to be equal and sufficiently dried out okay all right fruit leather an option can be done in the oven, can be done in dehydrators. You don't really need a recipe for this. You can mix flavors, you can put jello in, you can, um, you can add spices and you can add fun seasonings. There's just fun things that you can do with fruit leathers. You can either pre-cook the fruit, um, you can mix it with pureed pumpkin and have a pumpkin leather. You can mix it with pureed tomato and applesauce. Now there's one that most people will be like, really? Oh yeah, add some cinnamon and spices, it's yeah. Okay, so uh, just to have fun with fruit leathers. We've done some fun things in Master Food Preserver with fruit leathers. Um, make it as thin as possible and make sure that again, you aren't going too high of a temperature and making sure that you have um, it sufficiently dry by doing that tacky touch all the way around uh, with your finger in the fruit leather to make sure that you got it dry enough. The edges may be a little brittle and that's okay because you'll condition that again. Um, wrap that up and make sure that you got it dry enough. Okay, we get a lot of questions on is it really safe to do jerky? Um, to, and, and the answer is yes. Um, it's not something that's necessarily for everybody but it is something that is an option and a lot of people do like their own homemade jerky. The one thing with jerky is to make sure that if I am using game meat that I'm killing the potential of any kind of worm or trichinella or something along those lines. We do get worm in bear, we do get worm in uh, some of our venison, we do get the, the trichinella in um, other meats, so we do want to be careful of that, and so I've given you that up there. And it isn't recommended to use raw poultry for home production of jerky, even as a ground mixture um, to mix with turkey or chicken. Just not recommended for the high salmonella content. So is it safe? Yes, if I get it dry enough and if I use my marinade and my um, saltpeters or, or other salts either in the form of a marinade or a rub that kind of thing if i'm using them correctly and in the right amounts the answer is yes i can still have safe um, pathogen free uh, jerky there's two different methods in terms of killing those pathogens that are used and most people don't realize this and I am quite pleased to say that we've done both of these me methods in our Master Food Preserver courses. 
We have done the pre-cook on the meat strips where they have, we've kept them in the marinade for a few hours. And then we actually simmer them in the marinade just to 160 degrees. So we do a temp check on that meat, then put it out on the dehydrator trays. Or after I dehydrate it, I put it in the oven and bring it to 160. And the method is there at 275 for 10 minutes. Um, and that's another option. A temp check is much easier on method one than it is on method two. You can see how do I get a thermometer, do a temp check, how do I right, handle this meat and get an accurate temp check. But there are ways to do that. Uh, one of them is the, the um, instant read well, what am I trying to say? Thermoworks. Thermoworks. Yeah, the Thermoworks. Thermoworks has, uh, it's a radar, it's a Laser heat surface. surface. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. See, I didn't need to explain it because you all knew what I was saying uh, without being able to say it. So again, this, this is possible. Now, I, I've got to say this right from the start, and Anna's taken uh, and, and helped with our Master Food Preserver classes two or three times now. And I don't love the quality of the pre-cooked method one jerky. I am not a jerky eater. I, I don't like jerky, but I, but I will eat it and it actually turns out quite nice. <laughs> but method one is grainy, it's gray, it's gritty. How else would you describe it? It's just like not as great. <laughs> it isn't, it isn't as good. Yeah. It just isn't. Um, it's, I, I mean, jerky's not pretty anyway, but this is really not pretty, <laughs> right? So again, it's an option, and there are a lot of people who still are okay with method one, um, but most people prefer my marinating my raw meat strips and then dehydrating those raw meat strips. Now, there are actual dehydrators that do get to a hotter temperature. Those are nicer. Um, to be able to do that. But the one problem with a hotter run on the dehydrator with meat, not just with other foods, is I get this case hardening. It's where that shell of caramelization of the meat sugars and meat proteins and everything close it off so I can't get the moisture escaped out of those meat slices. So what we do is not only do we go through and pat with a paper towel the fat off of it so that for storage it stores longer, but we crack, we literally will take the meat strip and crack, 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 put it back in the dehydrator. And then a few hours later we'll go back, crack, 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 crack. Right, to break open those slices. I don't tear it in half. I'm just cracking the shell that's formed. Make sense? Okay. So once the jerky is done, and I have checked the temp on the, uh, the um, heat temp of 160 on the meat, um, dried that out well enough so that it is nice and leathery but still dry, I can then go ahead and package that up. So that's the last slide in terms of just a reminder for, you know, safe food handling, Clean hands, clean equipment. It doesn't even have to be jerky for that matter, right? Just make sure that you're doing everything well, sufficiently for microbial growth, pathogen growth in dehydrating fruits, vegetables, um, or other foods that you might be using for your dehydrators. Any questions or comments that we haven't covered sufficiently that you want to ask about? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Absolutely. How would you like prevent that from happening? Right. So I would one check more frequently, uh, two run the temperature more down at maybe the 95 to 100 degrees. It's going to take a little bit longer, but yeah, there are some that will get almost like a, a two done, two yeah, and and they will get almost like a scorch look to them. Okay. So is that also a like if that happens, could you move the trays around? Yep, rotating trays, thank you, yes. Always rotating trays is an option for and the heat source being right on the top coming down, well, it's on this one. So I'm gonna rotate this out so that I don't get that potential of overcooking, if you will, rather than dehydrating the food. Yep, 
rotating trays is always a good option. Any other questions, comments? I know this was a long class and I even said to Vicki, this is gonna be a long class because there's lots to talk about. So thank you for your time and attention and I'll be here for a minute if you wanna come up and look at these. Um, they've got some great dehydrator options here. We, we actually love this one in our master food preserver class. It's just getting the hang of the stacking of the trays, but this is, these are great dehydrators. So come take a look if you don't have one because they're priced reasonably. Right. Oh yeah, the door price. Yes, thank you, Teresa. Yeah, exactly.